You are listening to Keystone Stock Talk Podcast, episode 149. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at www.keystocks.com. Come back often, and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or on iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Keystocks and on Facebook or via our 24-hour streaming radio station, pennystocks.fm. And keep submitting your stocks via the usual social channels or at our website, keystocks.com, for our Your Stock Our Take segment. And we just might review your stock in an upcoming show and let you know if it is a buy, sell, or hold. This week, coming off our webinar series, Summer School for Your Portfolio, we are excited to take a look back and review a few of the questions answered during the past couple of weeks at that those webinars. We have two Your Stock Our Take segments for you. The first is a comparison between a tremendous Canadian tech consolidation success story that would be Constellation Software Inc., symbol CSU on the TSX, and Topicus.com Inc., Symbol TOI on the TSX Venture, a Netherland-based diversified vertical market software provider, which actually spun out of Constellation earlier this year. Aaron will compare the two and look into which may offer better value and growth potential at present. Our second question involves a comparison as well. A listener asked us to compare tech giants Amazon.com, symbol AMZN on the NASDAQ, and Alibaba Group Holdings, symbol BABA on the NASDAQ. Stack as well. Brennan will break down both businesses from a broad view and compare the growth value and weigh the risk factors in each stock. So let's get right to it this week. Uh, I'd like to welcome my co-hosts, Brennan and Aaron. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Good, good. Thank you. I think we have a good uh, good lineup here for solid companies that we can compare. So yeah, and I thought Excited. it would be interesting to go over some questions, uh, you know, that were asked, uh, a couple of questions that were asked from our recent uh, live webinars and uh, answer those live on the air here as well. Uh, we answered those uh, to the attendees in person uh, via the live webinar, but we can answer some of them here today as well. I think it'd be instructive. I got to say, in the first segment, though, Aaron, uh, you were struggling a bit. It was really hot here, <laughs> and you had no apart. AC. It's funny because AC. Ryan had a picture <laughs> were literally at the start melting. of the DIY with this pug that was just looked like it was melting from the heat and said it was me. And, but yeah, I actually dog. think that that, that that the picture of the dog, it looked like it was doing better than me because I had, a, I had to change my shirt halfway through the seminar. I was just, people were in the comments saying that, Aaron looks like he's not going to make it through his segment. He's just, I was just sweating. Um, so this is right in the heat wave. I'm in my office. Um, it's a little noisy outside, so I got to have to keep the windows closed. I can't have a fan running, no AC. So it was, uh, yeah, it was tough, but we got through it. Yeah, on camera, I sweating I is, that I, is I did not fun. Through, no problem. And, no, it's not fun. And and it does show up. And the better and better cameras are getting, it's it's showing up more and more. Well, I wasn't I sure do... people would notice because I'm when I'm doing the presentation, the the video of me is just a little thumbnail up the top. But no, people definitely noticed and they somehow come. people still notice. No, it's I if didn't you even were realize glistening. you changed shirts though. I didn't realize you changed shirts until I not was on air. Not on air. No, thankfully. no, I'm <laughs> course not <laughs> but i mean just when he came back with a different color shirt that, that, you know i didn't even realize until i was that's editing. a different kind of seminar <laughs> i'll tell you one thing I'll, I'll tell you guys a quick story here i think i've said before but i i about 10 years ago i was doing a hit on bnn a small cap sector looking at three or four companies there and it was the middle of summer and it was uh just a hit downtown vancouver you do it in the corner of the then the ctv studios and all it is is a camera facing you and you're in the corner and it was in the corner facing the sun with sun beating down on you. And it was about 189 degrees in there. And I'm sitting in the corner and all immediately, like you're in a suit, so you have to be all buttoned up in the suit and everything. Immediately, I just start sweating. I, I'm not nervous for the interview because I've done a, a ton of them, right? But 
it's just so hot. I'm just sweating. And all I'm doing is looking at the camera and they're in their air conditioned studios in Toronto. Right. And they're interviewing me. And I'm just, just from moment one, I'm pouring with sweat. And I'm just like, Oh God, this is just going to look ridiculous. So but you got to focused on the fact that you're doing well, of course. A, a financial interview in front of tens of thousands of people. And the other fact that, you know, you're basically As I'm melting. swimming in a pool of yeah. your own. Yeah perspiration so yeah and and you you have the question coming in in one ear and out the other ear you're just sweating and, and the mic is slipping out because there's so much <laughs> sweat out of my ear honestly it was ridiculous right yeah. yeah and i'm like trying to push the thing back in are you okay well, yeah anyway a little the, bit of financial you think and you just people right Oh yeah. And, and you think it just looks, but the cameras like 10 years ago, they weren't as good. You didn't have the HD. So I went and watched it back and um, there's literally, you can't even tell maybe a little bit of a glisten. Right. But like, I swear our cameras now that we use just web cameras are better than those cameras even 10 years ago. So, but the funny part, I, I, a friend of mine was going to be interviewed the next, it was the next day, the same place from Vancouver on BNN. And he was on there and I noticed that there was a glisten. So I watched it. I noticed and I call him right after on his cell phone. I'm got, I'm like, oh, my God, you look like such a clown on there. You're sweating all over. And he's just like, oh, no, I knew it. I do it. And I'm like, oh, no, no don't worry. It does, the camera doesn't even pick it up. But I had him sweating more after the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the hit than actually during it. But anyways, those are those are the fun of doing uh on camera work when you're uh, in 180 degree weather it was ridiculous but the second one you had a fan on you and and you looked well, a the lot second better, one that he waved it past so it wasn't it wasn't it's as true. much of a factor it's it was true. nice so le- talking speaking of those live webinars um there's some q a's we had uh I, I thought it'd be instructive to go through. There's some of the questions in there. Many people are asking right now. We, there's a couple stocks we can review too as well. But I'm just going to read out the question, then I'm going to answer it. And if you guys have anything to add to it, then feel free to do that. But one of our attendees asked, and I'm going to quote here, I see inflation is a huge global issue. What types of stocks can outperform at least keep my portfolio ahead of inflation? So we answer that generally speaking, we view high quality, we want to keep it simple, high quality dividend growth stocks as a simple weapon to help client portfolios combat inflation. We would stress the dividend quote unquote growth element as key. Many of the high quality dividend growth stocks we cover consistently increase their dividends by five to 10% annually. And this should help portfolios not only keep up with inflation, but significantly best it over time, even if we see a significant increase. This would be versus, say, a fixed income bond, which pays a fixed coupon of, say, you know, a dollar per year for every 10 year, every year for 10 years. Uh, with significant inflation over 10 years, that coupon is worth far less than that original dollar in terms of purchasing power. Now, contrast that to a dividend of a dollar, that same dollar that increased 10% every year for 10 years forward. Your payment, if you keep increasing over time, can be upwards of 250, for example, if it increased at 10% every year. So keeps up, probably beats inflation. And if you buy a bit good business, you also have the potential for underlying share appreciation. So that is one of the ways that we would say combating inflation. Any comments on that, guys? So I'll just, I'll just start here. Um, a lot of what we've done just from an informational perspective is we've looked at research on what types of uh, sectors and assets have performed well in the past in, in high inflationary environments. The problem is, is that we haven't really had a period of sustained high inflation since the 80s. So it's difficult to really make comparisons on an apples to apples basis. For instance, how can you compare, how can you judge the technology sector today based on how the tech sector would have reacted back in the 1980s when technology was primarily more of a hardware business um, and this was pre-internet essentially you know nowadays it's just it's a completely different animal so yeah not apples yeah, to apples and, and, and of course traditionally you would expect um, you know commodities to perform well you would expect uh, like hard assets to perform well real estate anything that you know has value where you're going to be able to get, you know, in, in the case of rental real estate, hopefully an increasing cash flow over time. Um, but really, I think what it comes down to is a, a portfolio of really great businesses that are you know, some somehow essential that are able to um, p- 
possibly some of the costs on over time or that are you know great growth businesses that are prov providing important solutions to problems and if they are able to provide those solutions then they're going to be able to um, overcome high inflation so you know over time right and in some cases you have companies that are actually it's built into their long-term contracts they can pass a portion of inflation onto um, onto their customer uh, just based on the contractual agreement it's called index inflation indexation um, so you know these there's just different types of businesses but you know finding great companies putting them together in a portfolio profitable growth oriented um, some of them paying dividends that grow that's the way that we think you're best positioned in an inflationary environment or if we hit an environment that is not as inflationary as we think it might be Brennan yeah exactly you know I, again it's just holding those great businesses i believe that there was a question i can't remember if it was the first or the second webinar but someone was asking about using you know etfs or inverse etfs you know depending on i think they were talking about the overall market but i know in the past i have talked about inverse bond etfs but i just want people to understand as well that you know it's it's not a foolproof strategy it's more speculating than anything again what aaron just said holding just solid good businesses that can kind of you know push that inflation uh, or transfer it on to you know the consumer um, that's probably going to be your best protection and i'm just going to give it a little bit of an example here you know i was talking about using um, an inverse bond etf to you know potentially speculate and to hedge against possible inflation well you know i was looking at this index uh, I was thinking about purchasing purchasing it, and literally the day that I decided or thought I was going to purchase some of it, Jerome Powell came out in the U.S. and he made some dovish comments, basically saying that they weren't going to increase the rates. And this ETF ended up dropping 10% on the day. So you know, again, it, it's just relating it back to holding good businesses over the long term. They're going to perform. You know, not having that risk of you know just potential comments really moving a stock that are completely out of your control or I guess ETF I should make uh, the point but uh, but yeah I just wanted to add that as well um, that again it's really just holding great businesses good excellent then the next uh, attendee question um, a couple questions on this um, photon control they said a company we have recommended is being acquired by MKS would you consider now MKS or consider holding or buying MKS uh, well, our answer to this was in May, MKS Instruments, it's a public company as well, MKSI on the NASDAQ. It's a provider of technology that enable advanced processes and improve productivity. Um, they announced they would acquire Photon Control, which is PHO on the TSX, for $3.60. It's an all-cash uh, transaction. It's valued at about $387 million Canadian. Now, Photon was originally recommended several years ago at $0.46, cents, and then it was re-recommended this past year in the $0.80 cent range. So the $3.60 takeout is a great outcome for clients. We have recommended tendering shares to the offer. While we continue to like Photon's business, it will now only be a tiny component of MKS, which has a $9 billion market cap, and the last year its sales were $2.4 billion U.S., so it's really only a tiny portion of it. Even if we loved PHO at that price, um, it's still only a tall, small part of the business. MKS itself trades at relatively reasonable valuations, but the growth isn't huge and we find better value and growth elsewhere. So we're recommending taking the big cash profits and just reinvesting those in other current buys or focus buy recommendations right now. Probably guys don't have much to comment on that. That's basically what we're uh, recommending. So let's move on to the next one. Uh, attendee asks, can you speak to why a Canadian investor may consider U.S. stocks versus Canadian stocks? Well, our answer, I mean, this is what my answer to this would be. One of the, the biggest benefits of including U.S. stocks in a Canadian portfolio is the breadth of companies in the U.S. The U.S. market is just far more diverse and offers exposure to high-quality companies in sectors that are just not available uh, in a more limited Canadian market. Structurally, if you look at the Canadian market, with around 50% of it comprised of resource and financial stocks, diversification into key sector, sectors such as, say, just any big technology company is quite difficult. 
Uh, quite frankly, one limits a portfolio to only Canadian. If you do limit it to only Canadian listed stocks, the selection of high quality names in a segment such as cybersecurity is almost non-existent. I'll give you an example of this. Several years ago, we were looking to add one or two cybersecurity stocks to our client portfolios, believing the market to be one with a strong long-term growth outlook. So we scoured the Canadian market and came up with about five or six names, not even one of those names came close to meeting our criteria, minimum criteria for investment. So we performed the same search in the U.S. and came up with just under 60 stocks, ending in a recommendation on a company called Fortinet, FTNT on the NASDAQ. It's jumped from the $60 range to over 250 in the last few years, couple years. Without expanding our research universe outside of the Canadian market, we could not have found this type of quality business and gained exposure to high-growth, booming cybersecurity the market of cybersecurity. Now, the breadth of companies in the U.S., this is the main point, makes it an essential part of any Canadian investor's portfolio, in our opinions. And, and well, you any just, comments? just uh, first of all, right away is um, Canada, 2% of the global economy, accounts for 2% of the global economy. Yeah. Um, the United States, 25%. Of the global economy, so right there, I mean that speaks to the to the breadth of, of the opportunities. Um, but even beyond that, there's there's a different the the U.S. markets have a completely different composition than the Canadian market. So in Canada, very highly concentrated to resources, which are about twenty two percent of our stock market, and financials, which is about thirty percent. So over fifty percent in just these two sectors. Whereas in the United States. Uh, 30%, almost 30% just in technology, right? So it's a completely different, it's it's a completely different uh, focus in terms of where most of the companies reside. And if you want to get, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities in the U.S. market that you just couldn't access here in areas like cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI on the technology side. But another thought to that is that if you wanted to invest in ETFs like indexed ETFs, if you were to say buy a Canadian TSX index ETF, you would get this high concentration. So while that's supposed to be a very widely diversified investment, it's a fund that tracks the entire market, resembles the, or reflects the entire market, you really still highly concentrated in those two sectors. Now, if you were to then mix that, however, with a US market ETF like S&P 500, you're you're highly concentrated in another sector, but when you when you add those two exposures together, then you start to even out. So it's it's um, it's definitely something to consider. But one thing that I found interesting is when I I put these numbers together again recently, um, technology has actually become more of an important sector in Canada over the past couple of years, largely because of Shopify. Largely because of Shopify, <laughs> yeah. So Shopify yeah. is now, that's a good point, the largest company, bigger than any of the banks. But um, back when we originally did this comparison, uh, maybe three years ago, technology was about 5% of the stock market. Now it's doubled to over 11%. But I believe that <laughs> that extra 6% is probably mostly Shopify or perhaps likely. Not almost entirely, but you know it mm -hmm. could be seventy five percent because mm -hmm. of Shopify. So if it's just one company, again, it, it speaks yes, to the breadth. Yes. You just don't get the selection. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's look at the the next question. It's on an individual stock. Attendee asked, "Do you continue to recommend Aritzia ATZ on the TSX?" My wife loves their clothes. Um, in reference, we said to Aritzia, um, the stock has been on our focus buy list since the start of 2019, was a buy all the way through that year. When its shares traded in the 16 to $20 range. Now, despite facing challenges in its traditional retail stores due to the COVID restrictions, online sales have skyrocketed and the brand continues to gain ground in both Canada and the U.S., uh, shares have performed very well. They're trading around beyond the $35 range, um, driven the last quarter by a return to growth and a growth outlook for uh, this year and into next. Near term, the stock is not cheap. It trades at 36 times what we would say our EPS for this year and 26 times next year's forecasts. Uh, this compares to a historical average PE of around 20. So it's trading at a premium to its historical average. It does remain uh, um, on top of our and our only Canadian retail stock in coverage at presence, but we have a hold on it at, at presence given the valuations. We still think the company has like a five, 10 year growth path ahead of it. It's been a tough segment to 
eke out any gains in in terms of Canadian retail. But uh, this is one name that we uh, think is well run. There's good solid cash flow and uh, continues to have value if you're looking, you know, three to five years out. So what would be your top pick? We get this question a lot. Your top pick to become a new, the next Boyd or a new Boyd. Again, like I said, our answer was we feel this question a great deal. Boyd or BYD on the TSX uh, is a stock we recommended 12 years ago, which is, was literally the best performing stock in the TSX over the past decade. Now um, it is up around 10,000%. It is a very, very tough act to follow. Uh, a few years ago, when you know we get this question come in all the time, our answer to the question was a company called Expel, XPEL on the NASDAQ, an automotive paint protection film provider. The stock then traded on the Venture Exchange at $1.40. It's since graduated to the NASDAQ, recently closed at $85. So it's already well on its way to becoming the next Boyd. Now, having said this, this is what I would answer. Uh, pinpointing what stock will actually be the best performing stock over the next 10 years on the TSX with a high degree of certainty is really a fool's errand. What we try to do is search for businesses with a certain profile that lines up with the Boyds or the Expels of the world and have our clients build portfolios consisting of 15 to 25 stocks which align with that profile. Now, this gives investors a fighting chance of holding one of these next game-changing stocks in their portfolio. I'll give you a quick teaser on that. what that profile would look like. There'd be, you know, I'll give you 10 items. These are 10 items we gave in our seminar. But there's certainly more and a lot we would flush out on these, and you can't check them all off with every company you invest in. But what, number one, strong balance sheet. Two would be positive cash flow. Three would be attractive long-term growth path. Four, reasonable valuations, not the cheapest stock out there, not the most expensive. Uh, potential for a dividend or dividend increase would be five. Six, solid management team with a significant share ownership position. Number seven, businesses we can understand. Number eight would be operations in relative safe jurisdictions. Number nine, positive industry or niche outlook. And number 10, strong track record uh, from management or the company itself over time. So there's some that we'd like to check off. If you can check off seven, eight, or nine, or of course, 10 of those in the companies you invest in and have more of them checking that those boxes off of the 15 to 25 that you put in your portfolio, you have the fighting chance at finding the next Boyd or Expel for your portfolio. And it's as we said in the in the on the DIY, when we're answering this question, it's, it's or as, as you just said as well, it's very difficult to know in advance. But the more you invest in that profile of stock, um, the more likely you are to hit those boids and expels over time. And even if you're not hitting a full on boid or expel, you can also hit a lot of other really profitable uh, growth oriented investments. Yep. And some of those businesses will, even with all that profile, if you have 20 stocks in there, Two or three of those will not perform as expected or even as we expected, and that is to be expected. But if you have you know, 10 or 12 of them do quite well, and if you can hit one or two with really great returns, outstretched returns, tremendous long-term gains, pulls up your overall portfolio, and that's what we're trying to do for our clients, and it really can be powerful impact on your portfolio. But just investing with more stocks with that profile within your portfolio gives you that fighting chance to find uh, some you know the next boys the next expels of the world so let's get into our your stock our take segment it's time we answer a question on your stock in a little segment we like to call your stock our take buy sell or hold uh, Aaron's going to handle the first question it was on constellation software versus topicus uh, one spun out of the other topic has spun out and Aaron's going to take a quick look at those today. So this came question came from one of our clients on our, our weekly Q&A session. Uh, I thought it was it was really worthwhile to take a look at. Uh, the client wanted me to compare Constellation Software with Topicus Inc. Um, and just to determine whether or not Topicus was in a situation where they would trade it uh, at, at a similar valuation to Constellation. So let's get into this. We're going to do the comparison. Uh, Constellation Software, the symbol is CSU. This company trades at a price of just over $1,900 per share, and it's a $41 billion market cap. So what they do is they acquire and manage a portfolio of industry-specific software businesses. Uh, these 
software businesses provide specialized solutions to public and private clients. Uh, they serve markets like communications, credit unions, beverage distribution, tour operators, auto clubs, hospitality, and community care. And the company has over 125,000 clients in over 100 countries worldwide. And we are comparing it to Topicus.com Inc. Symbol is T-O-I. This company trades at $92 per share and it's a $3.6 billion market cap company. The description is very similar to Constellation. Topicus is a software company that provides mission critical solutions to public and private clients. One of the big differences between the two is, is of course size with Constellation having more than 10 times the market cap capitalization. Uh, Topicus was actually spun out of Constellation earlier this year in February and now trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, which is a little peculiar given that it's a multi-billion dollar market cap company. You don't see many of those on the TSX Venture. And Constellation continues to maintain a 30% equity ownership in Topicus, and I believe that they, they have over 50% voting rights as well. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna look at these companies side by side, um, do a really cursory investing or comparison and what we would get from this comparison is just basically some questions to ask um, if we were going to do in-depth research on either one of the companies or just to get a basic understanding of how the two compare alongside each other. So we're going to look at them based on growth, the balance sheet or the, the debt leverage, uh, valuation, and they just overall outlook or kind of looking forward in history. So first of all, growth, looking at Constellation, we're going to look at the recent numbers in Q1. Uh, revenue is up 23%. 6% of that was organic growth. The rest of it was from acquisitions. Cash flow from operations increased 37% to $495 million US. And the company during the quarter reported $448 million in acquisitions, uh, with an additional $198 million announced subsequent to the quarter. Now, in 2020, Constellation's revenue was up 14%. There was actually a negative 3% organic decline, and their cash flow from operations increased 55% to almost 1.9 billion US, uh, about, about 450 million in acquisitions announced for the year. Now, comparing this to Topicus, Topicus just started trading as a public company in February after the, the spin out, so we don't have a long history of information. I really don't like to, to go too far into the prospectuses and, and look at information that existed before the company was public because I find a lot of times the comparison isn't really that great. But we can look at the Q1 results on Topicus. Uh, strong revenue growth up 50%. Uh, 7 percent of that was organic and then cash flow from operations increased 33 percent to 160 million euros so uh in terms of growth both of these companies have been growing uh at a very strong rate um topicus obviously we don't have the track record but you know in q1 they're off to a great start as a public company now looking at the balance sheets um for for Constellation, they have a very healthy balance sheet, about 1.25 billion in debt, but 942 million in cash. So net cash balance, about 300 million. Very reasonable debt level for a company this size, 40 billion market cap company. Now looking at Topicus, the balance sheet is certainly does not look unhealthy. The balance sheet looks reasonably healthy, but it is definitely a lot noisier than Constellation's balance sheet. So about 180 million in, in euros in debt, 86 million in cash, so no problems there. But what I find um, creates a little bit more of a complication is just $3.6 billion in convertible preferred shares on the balance sheet listed in the liability section. So these are convertible. Uh, eventually, these are going to convert to common shares. But $52 million of preferred dividends were paid in the last quarter. So we would have to consider that when looking at the cash flow numbers here. It really kind of muddies the waters a little bit. I don't like these more complicated capital structures. I just, I really like it when businesses are clean. Uh, looking at valuation now for Constellation, uh, trading at about 45 times analyst consensus EPS earnings per share for 2021 and analyst consensus is for 23% growth in earnings per share going to 2022. Um, looking at the trailing cash flow trading at about 16 to 18 times trailing cash flow which is not bad. Now comparing that to Topicus, unfortunately this is where a comparison is difficult because we don't have much in terms of trailing data on the company, certainly as a public company. 
Uh, and then there aren't, I wasn't able to find uh, any real analyst estimates out there on the company as well. So it's really difficult to make this valuation comparison given that Topicus is such a young company. We could look at the, uh, the quarterly cash flow, um, try and do an annualization after accounting for prefer preferred shares. That's not necessarily the most reliable thing to do. At this point, you'd really, this is where you really have to kind of talk to management and understand the business. But I, I didn't see any guidance um, in the company's in the company's press release so uh, or or a corporate presentation on its website that would give me this information. So it's really I can't provide an accurate valuation on it at this point, at least not for earnings and cash flow. Um, so just comments, outlook on Constellation first. This is primarily a growth by acquisition company. They have been incredibly successful um, for, for many, many years. I think a, a track record going out for, for more than a decade here now. Um, people have always wondered, and I know analysts have always wondered in the past, like how long can this acquisition growth continue? Eventually, are they going to run out of candidates, especially as they get bigger? They have to you know, acquire more to, to generate that level of growth, but they have just continued performing year over year. So it's been a great business from that perspective. Certainly not cheap at 45 times um, analyst earnings, but you know, given the track record, the growth of this company, the good balance sheet, you know, I we can't say that that's totally unreasonable either. So, you know, that's that's that, that's a valuation that I think is still investable for sure. Um, but one thing that I really love about Constellation is just the business model in terms of they're, they're not actually funding these acquisitions with debt and equity like most companies do. They're actually funding them with free cash flow. So they are that that, you know, quintessential model of a company that is generating free cash flow, taking that free cash flow reinvesting it back in the business, making these acquisitions, reinvesting in high return assets. So I just love that 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 structure. And you can't, you know, they've been successful at doing this. You can't discount that. Like there is value in an organization and team that is able to do this over time. So it really looks like it has some strong fundamentals to me. Um, compared to Topicus, you know, Topicus, um, I, I don't remember if I mentioned in the past, it's, it's not a it's not a globally fo focused company. It's one of the differences is that it is focused primarily on Europe, whereas Constellation is more global. But I just find the Topicus, because it has a shorter history, a more complex capital structure, there's just less to go off of in terms of what I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning that it's going to be a very similar structure to Constellation and Constellation does remain a controlling shareholder in the company. So that will be beneficial likely to, to Topicus going forward. But there's just not enough information right now for me to really compare it and give a good assessment in terms of, yes, this is a successful business model. So if I had to compare the two, I would right now just go with Constellation for sure. Um, but Topicus is something that is definitely worth following over the next several quarters. Yeah, I think it's a good summary and pointing out the convertible prefers, you know, when, you know, when we see more valuations from other analysts out there, we'd be careful looking at the business based on like an EBITDA multiple. If you're pulling out interest payments, because they are going to be there and make sure, you know, if you're going to be doing that, it's based on an enterprise value. I'm just not a huge fan of more complex structures. I mean, it's not overly complicated. We've certainly seen more complicated structures, but you know, if you, if you hold, if you still think Topicus is a good situation, I mean, if you end up holding CSU Constellation, you own a 30% stake as well. So, I mean, right now it, you know, it probably looks like, and, and it's, I think he's, Aaron said 16 times um, cash flow. It's not that expensive. I mean, based on earnings, it, you know, it's, get, it's definitely uh, on the premium end of its valuations uh, historically, but, you know, based off cash flow, you know, relatively it's, it's not out of the realm in terms of valuation. No, and so this is a quick comparison that I'm doing. And what one would do with this information is is yes. these, this this type of a comparison provides the questions that you would then use to do deeper research on the company. Yeah, to interview management and go from there. Really understand the yeah. business. Yeah, for sure. So let's look at our second Your Stock, Our Take. It's time we answer a question on Your Stock in a little segment we like to call Your Stock, Our Take buy, sell, or hold. Uh, stock versus stock came in from Tyler via email. Amazon.com versus Alibaba. 
Uh, Brennan. Yes, thank you. I'll let you take so, that. So this one also came in from a client, Tyler, via email, as Ryan said. Um, so the first company, Amazon.com Inc. I'm sure everyone's familiar with it, but it is AMZN on the NASDAQ. Uh, currently trading at a price of... Uh, $3,645.16 has a market cap of $1.8 trillion. And for those of you that don't know Amazon, Amazon.com Inc. is an American multinational technology company which focuses on e-commerce, cloud computing, digital streaming, and artificial intelligence. Now, Alibaba Group, uh, Baba on the New York Stock Exchange I have. I believe Ryan said NASDAQ earlier, but I think it's on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, everyone out there, double check on, on that to, uh, to see which one of us is right. Um, and it is a, an ADR. Um, so well, I'm definitely at- right, but it's on the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. for So people don't have to look. So uh, Alibaba Group currently trading at a price of $213.30 and has a market cap of $580 billion. And for those that don't know, Alibaba Group is a Chinese multinational technology company specializing in e-commerce, retail, internet, and technology. Now, as Aaron just said, for his own um, comparison, this is just a very quick comparison. So, of course, we need to do a little bit more due diligence than this. Um, But just running through here, I I kind of go through the same things that he did as including revenue growth, uh, valuation, balance sheet, kind of an economic growth outlook. Um, But anyways, let's let's start. So looking at the revenue growth, Amazon grew its revenue at about 44 percent. And this is quarter over the same quarter last year, whereas Baba grew its revenue at about 64 percent. Now, looking at profitability growth again, this is for the quarter over the same quarter last year. Amazon's net income grew about 220%, its earnings per share grew about 216%, and its adjusted EBITDA grew 67%. Now looking at Alibaba's here, um, their net income and earnings per share were actually negative in the last quarter, so we can't look at the growth rate there. Uh, But it's uh, quarter over the same quarter last year, adjusted EBITDA grew at about 18%. Now valuation-wise, Uh, Amazon has a price to earnings multiple of about 68 times and an enterprise value to adjusted EBITDA multiple of 30 times. And Alibaba has a PE multiple of 27 times and an enterprise value to adjusted EBITDA of 18 times. So Baba, it does look cheaper here. Now, quickly looking at the balance sheet, um, Baba does have a, or appears to have a better balance sheet with uh, net cash of 49.5 million and a debt to equity multiple of just 0.14 times, uh, where Amazon is more levered, but it's of course not concerning. Uh, they have net cash of 7 million and a debt to equity multiple of 0.9, which again is very healthy for Amazon. Now, Looking at the economic growth for their primary operating jurisdictions, uh, these statistics come in from the International Monetary Fund. So for the US, it is predicted to post 3.8% GDP growth in 2022 and about 2.5% in 2023. Whereas China, the growth rate is projected to be about 5.6% in 2022 and 5.4% in 2023. So China and Baba have the upper hand here for longer term growth uh, in regards to the overall economy. And finally, looking at risk. Now, of course, Amazon does have some risk of antitrust violations in the US and European Union, but I feel like we've been hearing about this for some time and you know, realistically, I don't know if anything will ever uh, really transpire here. Um, and you know, personally speaking, in my opinion, Baba definitely has more risk than Amazon with the company fined uh, about 2.8 billion in the spring of 2021 for monopoly violations. And then of course there was that whole, uh, um, you know, conspiracy around Jack Ma um, not having great relations with the Chinese government, which obviously wasn't very good. So to sum it all up again, let's just quickly run through the points here. Now, Amazon's top line revenue is growing at a slower pace, but keep in mind, it is working off of a much higher revenue base. Is Amazon, Amazon generated almost the exact amount of revenue in the last quarter than what Baba did in its fiscal 2020 year? So, you know, they're almost equal here in, in relation to growth, in my opinion. Profitability wise, Amazon's adjusted EBITDA is growing at a much faster pace. So profitability, Amazon's winning uh, with the growth rate. 
Valuation, Amazon is pricier, which is expected due to risk of China and the fact that it is growing profitability at a higher pace. Now, Baba has a better balance sheet, but both are healthy. And looking at each company's key jurisdictions, the economic outlook in China is superior. And finally, on the risk front, again, I think it is clear that Baba carries a higher degree of risk. You know, having been hit with an antitrust fine earlier this year, and there was some concern with uh, that Baba CEO Jack Ma went missing, as I you know use my air or my fingers for uh, air quotes uh, after the tension grew with the Chinese government. That's that's not a great sign. Definitely uh, don't like to see that. So if I was forced to only pick one stock, I would likely go with Amazon due to the company's higher profitability growth rate and less geopolitical risk, despite its more expensive valuation. However, if I was interested in adding one or either of these tech giants to my portfolio, considering my own personal risk profile, which I believe is high to moderately high, I think I would add both to my portfolio in an equally weighting. Um, now, please note, this is not a buy recommendation on either companies. If I could choose any tech giant to add to my portfolio, it would be one of the companies that we recommend to our clients. Um, you know, and that we do have uh, two tech giants um, under coverage in our US growth stock research. So now pivoting, I've given my take on the businesses. Aaron, Ryan, what do you guys think? I just, I, I yeah, I think that the just the economic structure of how the economy works in China and the government involvement and some of the risks involved in that. It's just, it's, it's strange. It's, it's different than what we're used to here in the West. I don't like it. Um, I, you know, yeah, the Jack Ma thing was really kind of strange. And I've wondered about mm -hmm. that with, in, in the past, you know, think Jack Ma is the richest, uh, probably the most famous man in China. And I was just, I'd thought in the past wondering, well, can a man, of that stature, you know, more or less say, be free to express their own opinion um, in the country without having to worry about a government crackdown and uh, apparently not. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's it's a very different, uh, I'm not saying I wouldn't invest in Alibaba, but it's a very different legal system over there. It's a very different economic system. It's not something that I'm totally comfortable with. So there are certainly opportunities to invest in that economy, um, but I would be cautious. I would consider it higher risk. I like Amazon. I mean, it's the stock's never been cheap, but nor really should it be. I mean, it's a very high quality company, and at you know 60, 70 times earnings, it's really not. Um, it's really not that bad. But uh, yeah, I I I I, w I would agree with you there. I'd probably be very cautious on on Alibaba. Yeah, I guess. But <clears throat> Brennan is uh, going against uh, Warren Buffett's right hand man, Charlie Munger, on this one, though who, as a chairman of the Daily Journal Corporation, he his uh, firm um, disclosed recently a $37 million stake in uh, Alibaba, and that's good for 13% or 19% of the company's equity portfolio. So it's the third largest holding. holding. So Munger chose Alibaba. So you're definitely going you know against Warren Buffett's right-hand man. What does Munger know? <laughs> just kidding just kidding no he's uh he's he's a whiz no doubt. <laughs> i'm just gonna let you hang on that one just think about that for a while if you're looking for value i mean amazon's not a stock where you get value um so maybe he just mm -hmm. see sorry what was the position size again uh 19 percent of their equity portfolio is third largest within this you okay, know it's a so small it's, okay, i mean so 37 million dollar stake it's not a tiny but it's 37 what million? the daily journal Thirty-seven million. million. Okay, well, that's you know, it's not like he's he's. Pet, it's pet, chump change for Monger, but, or anything. So, but you know, it is a significant part of this business's overall, the Daily Journal's overall investment portfolio. Mm. They they have a uh, operating business and they take that cash flow from the core businesses. Like it, it has a legal newspaper and a courthouse software business, and it takes that core. Uh, cash flow that comes from those core businesses and invest in equities, mostly U.S. large or large U.S. banks. It owns the the se second and first largest holdings are Bank of America and Wells Fargo. But, you know, the third largest holding became, uh, you know, just in the last few months became a 19 percent stake in Alibaba. Um, you know, he's 97. So, you know, it doesn't guarantee that this was all his idea. Like this isn't his you know he's the chairman of this, but the, you know there would be other people doing research under uh, under uh, the Daily Journal's um, 
investment wing or their equity wing of the company. So, but uh, you know, I just like to hang Bren, Brennan out there yeah, and like saying the, we're going, like going against one of the greatest value the investors guy. of all time. Yeah, trust yeah. me. <laughs> Pardon? I, I like the bash. Brennan as much as the next guy make fun of him. No, on this one, I would agree with him too. I, I mean, having a stake in Amazon. Brennan doesn't uh, come up Alibaba. with many good ideas, so when he comes up with a good one, we have to, you know, we have to give him credit. Shots fired. It's true. At least, at least You've got to uh, give uh, give some credit. We're crazy. Surprised you guys too, keep right? me around. Oh no 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 no. <sighs> Just no. Because then we'd have to, you know. Somebody then, has then to get the coffee, to right? <laughs> No, it was a good job. You did a good job summarizing those two, and uh, now I'm immediately putting all my money behind uh, Alibaba right now. So as we speak, I'm investing on the opposite, the flip side of what you're doing. I'm kidding. It was a good summary, and uh, I think it was a good show this week. I'd like to uh, remind everybody to keep your questions coming into our Your Stock, Our Take segment. Uh, ask us anything as well, just like those questions that we outlined there from the attendees at our webinar. And uh, at that webinar is up and available on demand. You get uh, five to seven stock picks right there. So I encourage if you did not attend it, you still got a chance to log on to our website, set it up, get it on demand and view it tonight if you want. Again, thanking my co-hosts for uh, hosting with me. Keep rating us and reviewing us on iTunes. We'll keep pumping out this content. And as always, I wish you profitable investing. Profitable investing. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.